Syrup Leaf, Chapter 5, Part 5, The Calm Before the Storm. 15th of Hematite, 142. A human merchant caravan has arrived. Hopefully this will give us the opportunity to replenish our wood stockpiles, as we're completely dependent upon trade for that particular resource in this climate. I order all idle dwarves to bring the crafts of Bobatron, Gerblin, Orange Soda, Kourish, and Manuel Calavera to the trade depot. Well, uh, this is rather embarrassing. There is a row of levers just between the main chamber and the chasm, but I don't know which one lowers the east drawbridge to the trade depot. Although I suppose I could try every one of the levers. I've heard far too many stories of fortresses reaching an untimely end because of a single unlabeled switch that was holding back a magma gate. I have no choice but to awaken the previous overseer, 64-bit robot, and ask his assistance. He limps out of bed and points out the proper switch. Although the switch is labeled as bridge number four, I ordered its label changed to something a bit more obvious for future reference. The human caravan pulls into the trade depot, and we trade crafts of rock, bone, and cave spider silk for all the wood, alcohol, and food that they have to sell. Bob the Third and I meet with the human liaison to discuss a trade agreement for the next year. What would you like for us to bring next year, asked the liaison. As much wood, alcohol, meat, and fish as your caravan can carry, I reply. Uh, bring some metal bars as well. Bismuth bronze in particular, adds Bob the Third. I begin to wonder about this dwarf and his fetish for this particularly archaic metal, but I keep my mouth shut and nod my head in agreement. Bob the Third is an overwhelmingly popular mayor at Syrupleaf, having been re-elected in a landslide just a few days ago, and he's also the best miner that we have. It would be best for the fortress to keep him happy. Will there uh, be anything else? asked Liaison. Any pets, perhaps? Dogs? Kittens? No, thank you, I chuckle. War horses? No, I don't think that. Wait, what? You have war horses? I sputter. Uh, yeah, yeah, we do. We would be happy to sell you a few if you'd like. Bob the Third and I look at each other incredulously. Uh, yes. Yes, I think we would like some war horses, I reply. 11th of Malachite, 142. As the human caravan rides off into the snow, I proudly look at our stockpiles. Not only do we have an ample supply of wood now, but we also have a wide selection of different foods and drinks. During the previous month, many dwarves had complained that they were tired of having nothing but dwarven wine to drink. I hope that our new variety of spirits will raise the spirits of our dwarves. But what of our metal stockpiles, I wonder? It is time that I check in at the furnaces to see for myself. I visit the bustling furnace operations. Frederick, the dungeon master, is doing an outstanding job of overseeing the production of steel, gold, and copper. I walk over to congratulate him. Frederick, this is excellent. With you in charge of furnace operations, I'm free to focus on other things. Uh, well, I'm doing the best that I can, says Frederick uncomfortably. I admit that it's... Somewhat difficult, though, seeing as how I don't have a proper office or desk to deal with the paperwork. Uh, for that matter, I don't have most of what I require for my role as a dungeon master either, but I'm able to make do. I flush with embarrassment as I realize the implications of this. I've not seen to it that my own second-in-command has what he needs, and Frederick has not taken it upon himself to request the metal workers to work on the things he requires. He's truly put the needs of the fortress before his own. I immediately order the metalsmith I'm Lemon to begin working on furnishings for Frederick, which will be made of solid gold. This seems to improve Frederick's mood immensely. 25th of Malachite, 142. News has reached me that our miners have struck another vein of gold beneath the mountain. Our military has stepped up its patrols of the surrounding area, but there have not been any threats for quite some time. Dare I say that the fortunes of Syrupleaf might have turned around? I ordered the entry corridor of the fortress to be paved with gold, knowing that such a display of our wealth is likely to keep the dwarves happy. Vox Nihili takes a break from working on steel armor in order to produce the golden bricks to pave the entryway. Our military is attacked for the first time in almost two months, 
as Lackloss is attacked by a Batman while on patrol in the caldera just above the volcanic magma pipe. Lackloss easily dispatches the creature with his bare hands. 16th of Galena, 142. Vox Nihili completes a stretch of the Golden Road connecting the gatehouse to the main chamber. The situation continues to improve here. The dwarves are as happy as I have seen them since I first arrived. Even Skaw has recently come out of his depression to organize a party. 30th of Galena, 142. Just before Autumn arrives, 64-bit Robot's leg, although still tender, has healed enough for him to leave his bed. A celebration is thrown to honor the former overseer. As the summer draws to a close, it seems as though nothing can go wrong here at Syrupleaf. There are still no signs of those fictional spawn creatures, I think to myself with a chuckle. Why were we all so afraid? Syrupleaf, Chapter 5, Part 6 The Nightmare Begins Second of Limestone, 142 The dwarves of Syrupleaf are beginning to relax. I'm tempted to do the same. But I know that the Sand Raiders could strike again at any time. Armok only knows why they would have ever made the journey here in the first place. Vox Nihili believes that they have heard the tales of the legendary golden boot he created several years ago, and wish to steal it. I... suppose that's as good a reason as any? Regardless, I believe that it is always better to be proactive rather than reactive. So I order three more dwarves, Spermy Smurf, Swat Jester, and Feros, to be recruited into the military, they're outfitted with the Humanity's steel warhammers and Vox Nihili's steel full plate armor. I'm accosted in the central chamber by a dwarf that I don't recognize. Jasimus, I'm going to need a leatherworks to be constructed as soon as possible. Give the order to make it happen, he demands. And just who are you? I ask. I'm Mystical Haberdasher, he replies. Why do you need a leatherworks? To perform some Mystical Haberdasher, you idiot, he cackles gleefully. I roll my eyes. Still, something good might come of this dwarf's sudden inspiration, so I give the order for the leatherworks to be constructed. Once the structure is complete, Mystical Haberdasher claims the workshop for himself. This had better be good. Twelfth of Limestone, 142. Glory to Armok! In the distance I can see a dwarven caravan from the mountain homes approaches our fortress. Although we are not in an immediate need of any particular resource, we can always use more wood, food, and alcohol. I order the trade depot drawbridge to be opened. Later that day, Mystical Haberdasher begins work on his construction. 13th of Limestone, 142. The first of the dwarven wagons rolls into the trade depot. I permit myself a smile, which quickly widens into a broad grin. We have all the resources we need here, and we will soon be purchasing more of that which is scarce. Our entryway is being paved with gold at this very moment. Our military patrols have complete control of the situation outside. I stop for a moment to consider my appreciation for the soldiers patrolling outside Surbleaf, who have made the area around the fortress safe in spite of the bitter cold. I look up. One of these patrolling soldiers, Syntax, is sprinting for the city gates right now. His face is deathly pale. Jasimus, call everyone inside. Shut the gates, he screams. What? What is it? A vile force of darkness has arrived. The spawn. I quickly climb to the top of the hill above the gatehouse and survey the area. To the northwest, I can see some shapes in the distance. They're closing in on the fortress rapidly. I ring the fortress alarm bell. As the last of the military patrols scramble into the gatehouse, I sprint back into the gatehouse myself and look to the trade depot to the east. The rear guards of the dwarven caravan are standing there, confused on the bridge east of the depot. I scream at them to hurry across the bridge. As they scramble into the trade depot, 64-bit robot pulls a couple of switches, retracting the bridge to the east of the depot and raising the two gatehouse drawbridges. The gatehouse and trade depot are now sealed off. Skullbuggy and I climb to the top of the trade depot to survey the area. The snowstorms have died down, and we have a clear view from this vantage point. Approaching from the northwest, we see no less then 17 large humanoid shapes. As they get closer, I can see that they have stumpy claws for hands and a horrible toothy vertical mouth or something like a mouth 
between two misshapen eyes. One of them is much, much larger than the rest. As they approach the fortress, the creatures ignore a nearby woolly mammoth, which rumbles away from them as fast as it can in terror. The leader of these creatures is clearly a couple of feet taller than the fleeing mammoth. Dear Armok, the thing must be 16 or 17 feet tall. Those... Those are the spawn? I ask Skull Buggy. Yes, he spits out in terror. And, and the large one is... Is that... Holistic Detective? I, 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 I don't know. Skull Buggy wrote, I woke up and I still smell brimstone. It's getting so much worse and I can't sleep. I don't like where this is going. I'm going to try to sleep. 13th of Lime, the fifth year. I smell brimstone really bad now, and I think something bad is happening. Tassid wrote, 15th of Hematite, 142. Word around the fortress this fine morn is that of a human caravan coming. I pray to Armak nothing is here to greet them this time. I've been keeping to myself of late. It's hard here because there's little for me to do at the time. I know my time will come, and I can occupy my time with more booze and food. What has felt like only days has been weeks. How I have missed that feeling. 25th of Hematite, 142. Skull Buggy came to me yesterday and asked if I could smell anything. Other than my own brew-ridden gas, I couldn't. Poor Dwarf has been getting more and more stressed as the weeks go on. We discovered a vein of gold today, which has made everybody a little happier. I'm starting to feel like it wasn't in vain coming here. Syrup Leaf is really looking up. It's still cold as it always is and always will be, but... We've not been attacked of late, which is nice. The loss of a few dwarves a few weeks prior shook us all, and the procession after was a bit too much for some of us to handle, but keeps you grounded, you know? 13th of Limestone. Fortress is quiet this morning. Don't know why. 13th of Limestone, entry number two. Hell on earth, they are here. The spawn is here. I thought they were joking. If this is to be the last time I update this cursed book, then I pray that the place I head is better than here. To whomever reads this, my family are in Hawkjester Fortress near Tackengard. Send them my love. Make sure they read this. Recursive wrote, Diary, first entry, 8th of Hematite, 142. Batman. Why did it have to be Batman? Batman. If it weren't for that quick-shooting crossbow woman, we'd be taken right now. Taken like our sister back in the old country. Taken to a dark, dank, guano-filled cave to die horribly. I can't imagine anything worse. Maybe I should aspire to a better profession than a collector of bones and garbage? But one does have to start somewhere, doesn't one? Swatchester wrote, Diary of Swatchester. You know... It wasn't so bad when I was given the choice of life in prison at head shoots, which I was a founding dwarf of, or being sent to this holistic spawn forsaken glacier. I don't mind the cold. I'm a carpenter, it doesn't affect me. As long as the idiots that run this place can bring me wood, I'll make life better around here for everyone. At least it won't be so goddamn hot. And then the reckoning came. Some moron babbling about pumps and a gimp with a busted leg came up and broke the bad news to me. Swatchester, you've received a great honor. You gets to go to war. I stood, mouth agape. War? Fuck that. I'd put that part of my life behind me. I never again wanted to feel the weight of a hammer within my hands, striking anything but wood. Certainly not soft, quivering flesh as I pounded it into a fine mist and reveled in the jelly-like remains of what used to be brains of goblin and dwarf alike. I was once the entity of death a living hammer, and I could feel the bloodlust calling again. It must be done. It shall be done. I will again become war. Syrup Leaf, Chapter 5, Part 7, A Caravan Attacked. 13th of Limestone, 142. I turned to address Skull Buggy. You say that these creatures have besieged the fortress in the past. How did you deal with it then? We closed the city gates and waited for several months. Eventually the creatures would leave to search for other prey. Then that is what we shall do. Our dwarves are safe, and the merchant caravan is now safe as well. We'll wait the creatures out. 
As I say this, another half dozen merchants clamber over the crest of a snowbank, their pack mules carrying bins of items behind them. The drawbridge is already up. These merchants have arrived too late as the holistic spawn continue to close in on the fortress. Shit. Against my better judgment, I yell towards the gatehouse for 64-bit robot to open the eastern drawbridge, hoping that this will allow the last of the merchants to reach safety. He nods and rushes into the fortress. A dwarven merchant stands in front of the raised drawbridge on the far end of the moat, looking across at his fellows in the trade depot. I scream to the merchant to move out of the way. He does not understand what I'm saying before it's too late, and the poor dwarf is squashed to jelly beneath the drawbridge. I turn and look to the south. At least 30 more of the spawn are approaching in the distance from this direction. Skullbucky and I scramble down from atop the trade depot and rush back into the gatehouse. A merchant guard fires a crossbow at the advancing horde. One of the creatures is hit but is barely slowed. The other 50 continue to advance towards the depot at full speed. A swords dwarf in the merchant guard valiantly engages several of the spawn in order to give his fellow merchants time to reach the depot. He wounds a couple of the creatures and slows their advance, but is hopelessly outnumbered. As the swords dwarf falls, another merchant guard, an axe dwarf, charges down the ramp to buy time for the remaining merchants. One of the beasts rips out his throat and he collapses, wheezing and bleeding to death. The remaining merchant guards including a mace dwarf, a marx dwarf, and an axe dwarf, have moved to the middle of the eastern bridge to hold off the advancing horde as the last of the merchants scurry into the trade depot. I realize that I now cannot retract the eastern drawbridge without sending these warriors to their death. One of the spawn reaches the bridge, crushing the lower body of the marx dwarf in its great claw. I watch the carnage from inside the gatehouse ready to give 64-bit robot the order to retract the inner bridge if necessary to protect the fortress, even though such an action would leave the merchant caravan to the mercies of the spawn. Nearby, Luigi's Discount, Lackloss, and Fellblade stand guard at the entrance of the fortress, looking on in despair. Stand your ground, soldiers, I order them. Lackloss shakes his head. We can't stand by and watch our brothers from the mountain home be slaughtered like this, he says. The three other soldiers nod to each other and rush towards the trade depot. Bobbin Threadbare wrote, It is with trepidation that I write these final words, final proof of my insanity, or a witness's account of the doom of all dwarven kind. Though my new neighbors have been forthcoming on most every topic, from the hardships of developing fertile ground to the sad deaths brought about by Batman and Sand Raiders, there was one subject, spoken only in hesitant whispers and broken thoughts, which refused to resolve themselves into a coherent narrative. Before my own experience, I knew only that they had come, and even our most stalwart warriors had refused to do more than hide behind hastily erected walls. But some months after my arrival, at a time when I had grown accustomed to new hardships and comforts both, I saw their arrival with my own eyes. They were putrid, disgusting masses cast into a mockery of the dwarven form. Their gangrenous pallor shivered my very soul as I heard their cries, a horrid ululation that sounded not so much as a dwarf as a host of crows. No, the very host of hell itself came to collect its dues. In the place of their hands, great, chitinous protrusions of a deadly sharpness grew full beyond the length of their bodies, so that their arms were dragged behind them as they ran, or else flailed about over their heads. Each spike seemed to cry for a dwarven head to be run through its length. A great rent passed down the length of their torsos, but far from hindering their survival, it appeared as if their former ribs had become as teeth and the whole was a cavernous maw which could only hunger for one possible source of food. Even as I watched, aghast at their appearance, I could see the opening stretch wide and close, as though a more monstrous beast were hidden behind the creature, waiting to consume any victim so unfortunate as to fall behind. 
even the legs of the beast were unnaturally long, allowing it to take great strides through the snow and quickly catch the poor souls caught outside when the creature arrived. Truly, I now understood why such beasts must never be spoken of, lest the thought of their existence drive one to desperate acts. Even now, writing this account, my thoughts stray unnaturally far from the gems that make my livelihood. Sirocco wrote, the Journal of Sirocco, third entry. Hey, diary! What excitement! An army of monsters is at this very minute bearing down on the fortress walls! I suppose I should really be scared, but spice is the variety of life. That's what my mother always said. Plump helmet in the morning and quarry leaves at night, they're good for what ails ya. I've seen what they can do and all, but... I feel that if we could just stop the senseless killing, we would all be so much happier. Perhaps instead of cracking their skulls in two with our hammers, we could just run out to them and give them a symbolic tap on the nose. Do they have noses? I don't think so, actually. <laughs> that sounds good. I'll have to suggest that to Jasmus. So, uh... Yeah, these soulless creatures want to rip us all to shreds. It sucks, but what you gonna do? Not you, Diary. You're just a wall. <laughs> but uh, uh, seriously, I think it'll turn out all right. Been surviving here five years after all. Besides, with all, all the little challenges in life, we would be such banal people. Living banal little dwarf lives. <laughs> Maybe. Oh, yes, I will. I think I'll write a war poem to inspire our brave- I'm writing in my diary, jerk. I'll get ready in a minute. Oh man, look what you made me engrave. I'm sorry, diary. Looks like the soldiers are going to fight the spawn at the depot. Such a bold move. I can feel my fingers trembling already. Desperate to engrave a spawn, making some kind of plaintive gesture. Supplication looks so good on stone. In other news, I asked Squaw to make me a flower press with one of his leftover logs, and to my surprise, he obliged. Hooray! I love all things verdant and natural, so it's a real shame I can't pursue my hobby here. Why, diary? Why? There's no flowers to press, of course. I felt kind of silly after Squaw had finished it, so I, uh, I pressed some snow instead. It's nice, but it's just not the same. I love this place. Maybe I'll build a gazebo. Bye bye diary! Lackloss wrote, from the Journal of Lackloss, 13th of Limestone, 142. The spawn have returned. Why? Why did I ever agree to come to this Armok forbidden place to begin with? Gold, they said. More gold than you could ever imagine would be at your fingertips. Drinks flow through fountains, and food lay rotting in quantities even the largest of fortresses could never consume. Lies. That's what I was told. And now I'm here, being told that the spawn have come. Enough is enough. It's time to take back this land. It's time to become a legend. It's time to end this. Syrup Leaf, Chapter 5, Part 8. The Siege of Syrup Leaf. 13th of Limestone, 142. As the remaining caravan guards leave the depot and engage the creatures, Luigi's discount, Lackloss, and Fellblade charge out of the gate. Another merchant guard, a sword dwarf, is quickly felled by one of the spawn. Lackloss is the first to arrive at the front line. The bridge acts as a choke point, preventing the spawn from approaching the fortress with their full numbers all at once. Luigi's discount and Fellblade arrive a few seconds later. The two of them hold the bridge as Lackloss engages the largest of the spawn that are nearby. Lackloss grabs the creature by the left claw and twists its arm, then shatters the limb with a powerful strike. He follows this with a roundhouse kick to the spawn's lower body, knocking it off the bridge. The massive creature collides with the ground, but then slowly stands up again, badly injured, but not defeated. As more of the spawn scramble up the ramp, Luigi's discounted Fellblade quickly find themselves surrounded. 
Fellblade smashes the foot of one of the creatures with her hammer, but two more of the creatures grab her body in their claws and attempt to pull the dwarf apart. Luigi's discount swings her hammer into the side of one of them, knocking its body into the other and sending them both off the bridge to the ground below. Unfortunately, her action is too late to save Fellblade. Three more of the creatures, having just ripped apart the body of a dwarven merchant, turn to make their way towards the depot. Lacklos punches one of the spawn in the throat, causing it to stumble and double over as the others charge past them up the ramp. Luigi's discount appears to be in a sort of martial trance as she swings her hammer back and forth at the spawn surrounding her. Another of the creatures is knocked off the ledge to fall to its death, and the chest cavity of another is caved in by a hammer blow. Luigi's discount proceeds down the ramp to take on more of the spawn. Nearby, Lacklos sees the large spawn he had knocked off the bridge earlier and takes it to the ground with a diving tackle. The two of them grapple on the icy earth. Luigi's discount stands atop a pile of several dead spawn. Three more of the creatures writhe on the ground near her, their arms and legs broken and mangled by hammer strikes. She ignores the crippled spawn and closes to engage the nearest uninjured one. At least ten of the creatures have been struck down by our soldiers at this point. The bridge and depot area has nearly been secured now, save for a few badly injured spawns still fighting the caravan guards on the bridge. Another wave of a dozen spawn crests a nearby snowbank and charges, closing in on Luigi's discount. At the rear of the group is a terrifying, seventeen-foot-tall behemoth itself, the spawn leader, its eyes burning with hatred. I turn to Skullbuggy standing next to me in the safety of the gatehouse, watching the battle unfold. The two of them cannot hold off all these creatures by themselves. Assemble the rest of our champions from the barracks. Skullbuggy nods and sprints into the fortress. Luigi's discount stands her ground, her hammer held high, as the second wave of spawn charge at her. Undaunted by their numbers, she smashes the leg of one of the creatures and shatters the arm of another. The rest of the group surrounds her, the spawn leader closing in behind them. Lacklos continues to grapple with the large spawn. He has broken both of the creature's arms and legs, but is beginning to tire. Luigi's discount strikes down two more of the creatures which surround her, as yet a third wave begins to pour in from this over the snowbank. Once again, she swings her mighty hammer, shattering the knee of the nearest spawn, which then falls forward, directly on top of her. Luigi's discount is pinned to the ground, unable to move. The remaining spawn charge up the ramp towards the depot. The spawn leader shambles over up to the prone and pinned Luigi's discount and crushes the helpless dwarf's head in one of its great claws. Exhausted, Lacklos finally breaks the neck of the spawn he'd been grappling, and the creature collapses in a heap. The joy of victory gives way to misery as Lacklos looks across the battlefield and sees his fallen comrade, Luigi's discount. Lacklos charges at the spawn leader with a scream and grabs the left claw of the titanic creature. Twisting with all of his strength, he hears a few of the creature's tendons pop. The spawn leader emits a piercing, otherworldly shriek and grabs Lacklos's body with his other claw. With all of its might, it throws the dwarf's body against the side of the glacier. I turn to the depot bridge. The last of the caravan guards has fallen as well. Now unhindered, the spawn begin to pour across the bridges. The merchants in the depot put up very little resistance and are swiftly crushed. I scream out an order for the drawbridges to be raised immediately before turning to flee into the fortress. I turn to look back over my shoulder. The drawbridges have been raised, but no fewer than a dozen of the creatures have already reached the gatehouse, including the terrible spawn leader itself. I continue to run down the golden paved entryway, the shrieks of the spawn echoing close behind me. The three remaining champions of Syrup Leaf, Kennel, Royal W, and Holistic Detective, run past me in the opposite direction, their weapons drawn. Bob and Threadbare wrote, Though terrified as I was by their appearance, my more experienced companions were unsurprised by their appearance on the slopes of the glacier. When I pressed them for greater information, they at last acquiesced, no longer afraid of the beast's wrath after their appearance has been made a certainty. They explained that these ravenous demons were the spawn of one holistic detective, a previously upstanding dwarf, reduced to a nightmarish caricature by the very fires of hell itself. However, their next bit of news chilled my very soul. 
This detective had been the dark champion of that dismal fortress, Head Shoots. My father's brother had traveled to this location shortly before his disappearance, and now I knew why. Alas, it appeared as if my own fate was to be tied to his, slaughtered by the holistic spawn as my uncle had died by the original's hand. Grim as it was, however, this fortress had withstood the appearance of these beasts before, and now it seemed a series of bridges had been built to deny access to the monsters of the field. However, much to my surprise and dismay, the order was called to let the bridges stand down. Our nascent army refused to hide behind the defenses and wished to send the monsters back to the hell from whence they came. I and my fellow caravaneers found ourselves worked into a panic as the gibbering monstrosities made their way at the slope. But even through the haze of my own fear, I noted that the others who had withstood the previous sieges felt none of our terror, but merely took into their hands whatever makeshift weapons they could appropriate. At least one had a maddened gleam in his eye, a look telling of both sorrow and determination. The constant reappearance of them had taken its toll, and now my fellow dwarves had withstood enough. Either they or we would die here today, the look communicated. Death would come to the gate of Syrupleaf, for one force or the other.